Spark out. <laughs> Spark out. Danny Gathon for pro boxing fans. It's a pleasure to have with me all the world from Louisville, Kentucky. Timothy Mayhem Moulton, how are we doing this fine Friday, my friend? I'm doing good, man. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. So we were fortunately able to get this interview organized because you've got a day off work. Uh, just before we yeah. start talking boxing, what's actually your day job? What do you do when you're not in the gym? Uh, so when I'm not in the gym, I'm working at uh, uh, a warehouse. Okay. Um, you know, just maintenance work. I'm a maintenance tech at um at a Gordon Food Service. Uh and then um other than that is boxing. How do you find managing that? Because I imagine going through camp as a heavyweight boxer is demanding at the best of times. How does you know working in the warehouse, which I'm sure it can be very tough at times as well, does it yeah. ever take a toll on your training? I'm sure it's not the easiest thing in the world Absolutely. to manage. Absolutely, man. Not only that, I'm also uh, a full time dad. You know, I got a fiance, I got a family. You know, um, so it definitely, um, Gordon, work working at the of having a full time job and on top of a full time job being a pops father, it does take away from training. You just have to learn how to uh, maximize your time and you know pick and choose the days that you can get it in. You know. Yeah, for sure. But I suppose at the same time, you know, being a dad, having a fiance, I mean, that's why you do it, right? Yeah, exactly. It's definitely, it definitely, uh, my motivation, it's weird how it's, how my boxing career has went. Um, you know, when I started in the amateurs, it was to be an Olympian. And then, you know, that was the motivation. And, you know, uh, as I, you know, for, for the love of boxing, you stay with it. And, um, you know, then it went from turning pro, you know, you want all the, the Floyd Mayweather money and the glitz and the glamour and, you know, uh, all of that is is what you wanted for for your reasons. But then when you find somebody and you go through life and you get your, your you know, your your family established and everything, uh, you want to make a, a better life and living for them. And, you know, you can do it with your fist. So uh, it's, it, the motivation It's funny how the motivation has changed. It's added, you know, I still want everything from that I've wanted from the beginning, but it's it's just funny how life goes and and uh, how every, the motivation changes a little. Was it always boxing for you? I mean, Deontay Wilder's story of he was a basketball player and he took up boxing to support his daughter who had a medical condition. Were there ever any other sporting endeavors for you growing up or was it always focused on getting in the ring? No, I was um I was boxing. I started boxing at 12. So how it went for me, I, I was 10. Uh, at 11, I started playing football. Um, I wanted to be uh, a running back uh, in the backfield, you know, a skilled position. And I wanted to lose a little weight. So my pops took me to the gym. And uh, from 12 years old, I, I, I played, you know, no more football. I played one year in high school just to really play with some of my um, my classmates and my friends. That's But other than that, you know, my focus has always been boxing. You know, I've just always been in the gym and always training. And that's what I knew that, you know, I wanted to make it in. Well, all these years later, and you're back in the ring, uh, September 7th, hometown. We are, at the time of recording, just over two weeks away. How are we feeling? Yeah, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. We got, um, At this point in the game, you know, not being uh, um, signed to a major promotion, uh, I'm sure – all boxing fans are in, enthusiasts and and uh, fighters and you know everyone knows how the game goes at the bottom, uh, you know selling tickets, um, you know making a payment for these guys and you know not being signed with a match room or or a top rank or a Queens Bear, you know you you don't get that um, that luxury of having those fights paid for and paves set up for you so. Um, you know, I'm I'm blessed to be able to have a busy year. You know, I fought in January um, with Dreams Realized Promotion here in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, I was able to get the uh, ABO regional uh, title. And um, I was even uh, fortunate enough to be uh, picked up on, they had something over in the United States called Team Combat League. I don't know if you heard of it. Michael Hunter fought on that. Yes, yes, Michael Hunter fought on it. So I was fortunate enough to get picked up by Team Miami. 
And I was down there training for a few months, and I actually had one fight in the team combat league. So that was something else to keep me busy and keep me sharp. And, uh, you know, now we're back in September. So um, I'm I'm definitely fortunate to have been and still be uh, as busy as I am with uh, not having a a big promotion or management uh, signing. Just on that, how was the experience with Team Combat League? It's a very different format. Uh, As you say, it was sort of American-centric, so we didn't get too much exposure to it in the UK. Uh, Tell the fans a little bit about that and how you found it. So Team Combat League is a one-round fight. So basically, um, you have... It's kind of like a uh, like football teams. So you have different teams. You know, you have like Manchester United, and you have you know your different teams. Well, over here in Team Combat League, you have each city had their own team. So I was a part of the Miami Stealth. Um, uh, there was Las Vegas Hustle, where Michael Hunter was a part of. Um, you know, um, they had uh, Boston Butchers, uh, who uh, Rashidi Ellis. I don't know if you're familiar yeah, with him. Yeah. Rashidi Ellis fought on uh, Boston Butchers. Uh, Jesse Hart and Joey Duico yeah. fought on Philadelphia Smoke. So uh, there was definitely, we on Miami Stealth, we had uh, Juan Carlos Payano, a uh, former world champion on our team. So basically it's just like you have every, you have the eight weight classes. You have one fighter that fights in those uh, eight weight classes. So it's eight versus eight, you know, round one, eight versus eight, round two. And then a money round where you choose only four of the, the divisions to fight against each other to get an extra point to possibly uh, get you to win. But you only fight one round at a time. So what's crazy about that is one round at a time, there's no filling out process. No. There's no jabbing around. There's no, you know, trying to figure out your guys, setting traps. No, you get two guys coming together and blitzing each other. And um, it was exciting. It was exciting. It was a good experience, and it was a, a good way for me to stay sharp uh, I benefited most because I was in a gym in Miami, which was like uh, Coach Herman and uh, Caicedo's gym is a highway for top heavyweights, everybody. You know, uh, Big Baby Miller has been in there, uh, Shannon Briggs. I got to spar with the, uh, an Olympian from France. Um, I also got to spar with Gustavo. He's a, the bare knuckle heavyweight champion right now and okay. an undefeated pro heavyweight. Um, so, you know, the sparring down there is unbelievable. So it was definitely a way for me to stay sharp and, um, you know, just to hopefully get ready for something big for myself coming in the near future. For sure. Well, glad it was beneficial for you. Let's circle back, uh, to just over two weeks time. I was looking up your opponent, Sergey Uribe Castro, uh, bit of an unknown quantity. It seems five and one, the one being a split yeah. decision. All his fights down in Mexico, I can't imagine there's too much footage of him circling around. Yeah. So how do you prepare for a guy like that? I don't, you know, I always go, I don't, I don't really, um, so I am, I am the guy that will look someone up. I am a, a, a plan maker. I do believe if you have a good, a good strategy and game plan, um, that definitely can sway the fight and make the difference. Um, I underestimate nobody, even at this level, you know, at this level, I've seen, fellow fighters in the United States. I've seen former national USA champions and undefeated prospects get upset by guys that come in from, from out of town, you know, the journeymans. So um, I am a guy that likes to look at and plan, but not having no type of footage on this guy, uh, it just makes me kind of click back to the amateur days. You know, you could get in there in the open elite amateur phase and, not know anything about your guy. You had to fight whoever was at that tournament. So when I'm fighting or when I'm in a situation like this where I don't know anything about him, it's just kind of preparing the best I can for myself, you know, making sure sure I'm as sharp as possible. Absolutely. Well, that said, I'm sure you're confident of getting the the win. Uh, Yeah, for sure. That happens. What does, in an ideal world, 2025, look for Mayhem Moten? Man, uh, in an ideal world for me, getting a shot on um, a bigger platform, um, it could, for me, uh, I'm all about taking it a step at a time and um, making sure that I'm ready. Uh, I'm not, I'm not over, you know, I don't, I'm not over anxious to take any super big, big opportunities um, that I don't think I'm ready for. Um, 
But I think that, you know, uh, uh, an opportunity on a bigger card, a bigger platform, uh, maybe an undercard spot somewhere, just to be able to showcase my ability and my skill uh, at a bigger, you know, um, a wider spread, you know, reach more people. Uh, on the, You know, if you fight on the TV network fight, you're going to get in front of a lot more people than you would fight in a local venue. So, yeah, <laughs> just being able to test myself at that level and to see, um, engage uh, where I'm at. For sure, fingers crossed. Just while I've got you, I'd like to get your thoughts on sort of the American heavyweight scene as a whole at the minute. Um, Deontay Wilder was sort of, you know, carrying the flag for the sort of best part of a decade there. Looks to be coming towards the end. And then we saw Jared Anderson, who was being billed as the sort of next American hope at heavyweight. Obviously still a young guy, could come again, but suffered a fairly conclusive loss to Martin McCauley. Yeah. You mentioned Big Baby Miller there doing his thing, had that fight with Andy Ruiz. You got yourself, you got yeah. Jermaine Franklin. What do you think about the state of the heavyweight division in the States at the minute? Give me your breakdown of it. Uh, I think there's some... Um, I, f- I feel like boxing does... it. You have eras, right? So I feel like just how right now in college football... You have seniors, you have juniors. I feel like the guys that were at the top and reigning, the Joshua's, the 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 Fury, you know, the those guys are getting ready to graduate. You know, they're getting ready to leave. They're they're getting ready to um, you know, be done kind of they're towards the end of their careers. Um, and I feel like right now in the United States, there's a lot of different ingredients. And there's a lot of different guys out there that uh, can make the division exciting and exciting place in the United States. And I think that we'll be able to um, have a couple of more um, contenders, world rated contenders than we have in the previous, um, the previous years with guys like Andy Ruiz and big baby and, and, you know, the Jared Anderson and the guys that we named the Michael Hunters, those guys have, already been at the top the level so those are the the guys who are leading the way right now for us but i feel like we have a nice if united states had a team and we had a 12-man team with some guys on the bench we'd be hell of a team yeah maybe that's one for uh turkey <laughs> to get going u.s versus uk heavyweight edition <laughs> yeah that would be great yeah that that would be a good card to put on i swear it would because we've got some good guys over here as well Sure. Just you mentioned Anthony Joshua there, Timothy. You know, the UK fans will be keen to hear about this. You've actually spent quite a lot of the time in the gym uh, with AJ. I believe it was ahead yeah. of uh, one of the fights with Andrew Rees. What do you make yeah. of where he's at at the minute? Because there was a lot of people doubting him after the the defeats to Usyk. He's in a good run of form yeah. at the minute. A lot of people think AJ's back to his best. What's your take on all of it? And it's just phases of the career. You know what I mean? Like. He was the he's um he's he's an he was uh anomaly special you know what I mean he went straight through he didn't have very he didn't have the the plethora of amateur fights that uh like a Lomachenko and them guys had so you got to think he still had time and still had room to develop um and become a better fighter uh he he also is a fan of the older uh fighters like I am so. You know, those guys, those their records are 48 and, six, you know, six. And those are the real deal fighters, the guys who are really dangerous. You know, Burt Coopers and guys like that that were out there that had, you know, Riddick Bowe. These guys had lots and loads and loads of fights. How many fights does Joshua have now? He, he only has like it's not even 30, the, right? No, mid-20s, I believe, still. Yeah, so you see, he's still got a lot, a lot of time to grow, and I feel like, him and the team around him, um, the guys that I know that are in his team, I just feel like they know what they're they're learning along the way, but they also know what they're doing. So I feel like he's shifting and he's, um, you know, just changing gears. I feel like, uh, you know, he's he's definitely going to be uh, he's coming back around to be a force to reckon with. I think that uh, who do you think he's gonna? You think Dubois is gonna beat Josh, or you think Josh is gonna be Dubois? As the media, I can't make a prediction. I can't make a prediction. <laughs> <laughs> I can't make a prediction. Okay. But okay. that brings me on perfectly to what my last question is going to be. Is the your prediction? 
Man, listen. I I think Joshua is the better big man. I think he's when he fights another guy his size, a big man. Like I feel like he's he's already found the um, he's got the answer to that that problem. You know what I mean? Anytime he fights a big man, a guy of his size, that he has the answer. And uh, I think that uh, it's gonna be, it won't go the full, it won't go the distance. I don't Very know what round one. he'll do it in. I don't know where he'll do it in, but I don't think it'll go to distance. Yeah, I'm not seeing too many people predicting this fight goes to 12. Uh, very last yeah. one, Timothy, because I appreciate it's a Friday and you've probably got stuff you want to be doing. <laughs> 2025, Eddie Hearn says it's the year we're finally going to see Joshua take on Tyson Fury. Now, I'm not saying I don't believe Eddie, but let's say the fight does happen. Who do you lean to in that one? It's a fight people have wanted to see for such a long time. Joshua knocks him spark out. <laughs> spark out. <laughs> spark out. He he's got the big man. He's got the card. He's got the he's got the answer. You know. Look what he did to Nganu. And look what Nganu, you know what I mean? Like, it's not that styles make fights, and he's got the big man card figured out. I don't think that goes the distance either. Wow. Well, Timothy, really enjoyed speaking to you. Uh Hope you have a good weekend. Looking forward to catching up to your fight. And, uh, yeah, hopefully some big things in hey, 2025. We'll also say this, too, in 2025, that Tyson Fury, Joshua, and then they call up Mayhem and say, hey, let, let's, let's, Mayhem, let's see you on that undercard. For sure. I'll put a good word in. <laughs> <laughs> all right, brother. Thank you for reaching out. No problem at all. Thank you very much for your time, sir.